over that. All right, so we're still in these first 11 verses of Philippians. Um, we're moving through this slowly, but there's a lot here. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit dense. So I want to take our time, and we'll take a little time today to, to uh, stop and talk through some of these things. But let me do just a, a brief summary where we are. We know Paul's writing from prison, probably near Ephesus or in Ephesus. And he's writing to this church that he seems to dearly love in Philippi. Um, it's a letter of joy. And he starts by telling the church that he prays that they'll have both unity and holiness. And we were saying that those two are very difficult to achieve at the same time. You can have unity without holiness, holiness being the way we behave, people living rightly. You can have unity without holiness or holiness without unity, but boy, it's hard to have both. You can have unity if you don't care how everybody acts. You just kind of, people live as they see fit, but for the sake of unity, we kind of ignore all that. Or we all live in a particular way, um, and if we, if, if we don't, then we give up unity and we let people leave or we ask people to go because they don't live rightly. They don't live and demonstrate holiness in their life. So you could have either one, but we want to be united and holy. And he's, he's putting that challenge out before the church in Philippi. He talks, too, about um, the day of the Messiah, the day of the Lord, this concept that goes way back into the Old Testament. And then you see it there in verse, uh, in verse 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what used to be the day of the Lord, the day of God, is now the day of Jesus Christ. And he's basically saying that that day is divided into two parts. There's the first coming of Jesus, his teaching, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, all of that. And that's in verse 6 when he says, the good work that has begun in you, all of that. But then there's a time when it's going to come to completion. And that's all going to be through Jesus as the Messiah. Um, we know God differently now because he came, but we're going to know him differently again when he comes back and he puts the whole world right. And that's true for all of creation, but it's also true for each of us as individuals. He'll put each of us right. We will also be restored to complete wholeness in him, body, mind, and spirit. All will be well at the second coming. So he, he puts forward this concept of sort of a, a two-part day of the Lord in Jesus. Um, he went on then and got very personal with them and said he holds them, uh, this church, in his heart. It's a very unusually personal statement for someone writing a letter in that day and age. You typically wrote specific information. You didn't write letters like we might write to a friend or a family member uh, in the days when people actually wrote letters. Um, you didn't, you didn't talk personally like this, but he's doing that. Uh, he holds them in his heart, and he says that he prays for them in that their love may abound more and more, overflowing love for one another. And he's speaking to them as this very diverse community of believers. So he's calling for unity and overflowing love and holiness of life among a people that are very, very different. People that you may never, those, they may never have uh, associated with one another outside this church. There would have been Romans and non-Romans and Gentiles and Jews and Gentile believers 
and even foreigners, because they were right on a trade route. There would have been foreigners there. There would have been ex-military there. There would have been active military living there. And the assumption would be that this group of believers is probably this eclectic mix of all these different kinds of people who outside this church would never associate with each other, especially the rich from the poor, because there was very little in the way of a middle class in those days. You were either wealthy or you were poor. But this church, they're all together, and they're able to be united because of their, the faith they have in Jesus Christ. That's what becomes the primary glue that holds them together. They now have an identity in common as believers in Jesus Christ. Sec that, that is primary to whatever else their identity is in their life, their job or where they're from or their ethnic background or who their family is. And he goes on to say to them, um, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, verse 9, with knowledge and all discernment. Knowledge and discernment. To be able to tell the difference, knowledge and discernment in Scripture is needed in order to tell good from evil. Knowledge and discernment so that, he goes on in verse 10, you can approve what is excellent so that you can be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So not only are we to be united and holy, all living rightly and united in our belief in Jesus Christ as our primary identity, but we're also called to be knowledgeable and have discernment so that we might be able to tell good from evil, so we can approve what is excellent. In other words, that we can embrace in our lives the things that are good and to be pure and blameless, blameless when the day of Christ comes for the second coming. They're saying this to people, some of whom have been leaving, leading a pagan lifestyle, which was sort of anything goes. And now there's this set of moral standards that because they're believers in Jesus Christ, they're called to this kind of holiness of behavior. This is a tremendous challenge that he puts out there before them of what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to look like. So, and this is all that we would be faultless on the day of Jesus. So he's talking about the future now. Um, that's kind of where we, we dropped off last week. He draws this picture that we are headed somewhere. We are, we are on our way to this time when we will want to be found pure and blameless, that there's a time coming at the second coming when we want to be viewed as pure, blameless in our lives. It reminds me, and so he's calling them to be to persistence as they live and they wait for this day. It reminds me of when I was a kid, I was 16, and um, I was living just outside Millvale at the time, over in Shaler, and it was the centennial for the borough of Millville. It was 100 years old. Oh, they've been planning this for years. There was going to be parades and street fairs and all kinds of great things. Well, we found out, I was going down, it was a Saturday morning, I was going to go down for this parade, me and my friends. And we found out that it was also an election year, and Hubert Humphrey was going to come to Millvale and ride in the parade. And I couldn't believe it. A presidential candidate, never met one, never saw one, live and in person, was actually going to come and be part of this parade. Well, I didn't, I didn't even really know who he was, but I knew he was running for president, and I wanted to see this guy, and golly knew I wanted to shake his hand. So we're down here and we're watching this parade and the streets are just jammed and we keep waiting to see him and it doesn't come. He doesn't come. He doesn't come. More bands, more fire trucks, more police cars. We're waiting for him. 
And, sorry, that was my phone. Um, all of a sudden, at the end of this parade, comes this convertible, and in it is sitting Hubert Humphrey, um, and he's waving, you know, from the back seat, and there's uh, security all around him walking along. I'm really surprised, you know, after the, the assassination of Kennedy that people, political candidates would still sit in the back of, a, uh, of an open convertible and drive through the streets, but that's what he was doing. And so I come in behind this car and I follow it. I'm right behind the trunk, right behind some of these uh, security guards, and I'm just going to follow. And crowds kept pushing in because this was the end of the parade now. Crowds are pouring in behind us. And I'm doing everything I can to stay close to this car as he drives all the way down slowly through the entire town and finally pulls out sort of near where the 40th Street Bridge is today. And the car pulls off to the side and he gets out. He gets out of the car and starts shaking hands. And I run up there and I shake his hand. And I can remember his hand was very, very soft. I remember thinking, this is not, his, his hand isn't like my dad's, which, was a, which were hands that worked and were rough and callous. This man, feel, it feels like he's never done a, a hard day's work with those hands in his life, which is probably true. The point of that story and how it relates to this was the persistence for the day that the Lord comes. It was my persistence for the day that I would get to meet, the moment I would get to meet Hubert Humphrey and that I would be there and that when he would get out, I would be there to shake his hand. It's kind of like that. It's a persistence in our life of living in the way we need to live, continuing to pursue our relationship with Jesus Christ so that when the day he comes, we're there up front to shake his hand. We are there pure and blameless on that day. So it brought that, it brought that experience to mind for me. And when he comes and he's going to put everything right, it goes on to say that uh, in verse 10 and 11, pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God that we would be filled with the fruit of righteousness. So this whole idea of fruit, that, that of course shows up quite a bit in Scripture, and it goes all the way back to, uh, to Genesis, where you'll remember that God says to Adam and Eve to be fruitful, go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. And there's this whole... Um, function built into life, all life, that allows it to be fruitful and multiply. You know, in a, in, in a simple way, you just think about fruit, right? Fruit grows on the vine or on the tree. It falls to the ground. It dies. Its seeds go into the soil, and it produces new life. That's the way God made the world to work. It works where life gives birth to new life. There's a death in between, and then there's more life. And that's what he commanded in Genesis, uh, Adam and Eve, to do. Be fruitful, produce fruit, and then that fruit will multiply. And he does the multiplication, doesn't he? He does. He, we cast the seeds, he grows it. Go forth, be fruitful. And he talks about that here that we would be multiplying righteousness so that our lives are multiplying righteousness wherever we go, whatever we do, and that's what people would see, and it would multiply. Our, our, our good, good works will multiply into even more good works. So to summarize these first 11 verses then, is Paul provides kind of a um, I call it a small working model of how this partnership that he spoke about at the beginning, the partnership in God's work is supposed to be carried out. The way that we all work together, in this case, Paul and the Philippian church, 
but we, God's church, God's church throughout the world, how is this partnership in the gospel supposed to be happening? That we're supposed to be supporting one another, we're praying for one another, we're showing love and support, we're going to do it with knowledge and discernment, and we're going to do it with unity and living in holiness. That's the challenge. That's the picture that Paul draws for what he's hoping and praying for for the Philippian church. How can anybody do this? How can any people live up to that kind of standard? And his answer is, because now we have the mind of the Messiah. Now we think differently. So this whole story is being overlaid by this idea that the way we think needs to now be completely changed. The things that mattered to us before aren't to matter now. We have new priorities. Who we think we were, that's not important now. It's who we now are in Jesus because the Messiah has come. So it's a whole different way of thinking. And he's saying, that's the only way you're going to be able to live like this. It's the only way that the church is going to be able to carry forth is if we all start to think in a different way. All right, I'm going to pause there and let us talk a bit. Let me come out of this. And there we're all back together again. All right. So I want to come back to this idea of knowledge and discernment, unity and holiness. And so what does that mean um, to the church? What does that tell us about what the community of God's people should look like? How should we be living? What, what does the church look like when you look at those four priorities that he laid out? Unity, holiness, knowledge, and discernment. Let's, let's take them one at a time. Um, what does unity look like? <clears throat> Put some flesh on those bones. That we do things together. We pray together. We act together. There's, a, there's this sense of community, right? Of praying together, living together, working together, that we understand each other as a partner in life and in God's work. We understand that we're partners with one another. We're not lone rangers out there living our own Christian life. We're doing it within community. That's clearly been the case uh, since the time of Christ, that his people would be a community of people who do live and work in partnership with one another. We do things together. That's definitely part of unity. What else does, how else does unity look? I don't know if I'm repeating what Terry said, but working towards the same goal. Common goal. Conclusion. Common goal. Really important for unity, isn't it? There's something we have in common that we're striving for. Uh, in the political world today, we hear a lot of talk about unity. And that always sounds nice. Yes, we're going we're gonna to be united. But a lot of people have come back and said, no, we're not going to have unity. We don't want unity because to you, whoever the opposite is, unity to you means we're just going to all start thinking like you. And we're not going to start thinking like you. That's not really unity, isn't it? I mean, I like unity like that. I like everybody to just think like I do, and we'll all be united that way. Wouldn't that feel nice? But that's not the way real unity works. To Melissa's point, unity is about having a common objective. We may think differently about how we achieve that objective, but we have the same goal. And I can appreciate your approach, and you can appreciate my approach, although they may be different. We may have to sort them through. But at least we're trying to accomplish the same Thing. Really important for unity. Yep. What else does it take to achieve that kind of unity? I 
think you have to be respectful of other people and of what they have to say, even if you don't agree with it. That sounds, uh, that sounds so easy, and yet we know that is it's so not, hard, but it yeah. is so right. Yeah. Um, you know, the word tolerance kind of has a bad connotation these days because it, you know, it has taken on this meaning that we, we see things that are wrong and we just turn our head and we don't do anything about it. That's, that's not the kind of tolerance that Paul would be talking about here. He's talking about a respect and appreciation for one another because we all have the same objective, which is most important, right? That the gospel of Jesus Christ be, uh, be spread and that people would begin to live as the Messiah would want us to live. And that message is out there. That's the objective we all have. So I have to be able to, first of all, respect and appreciate one another, understanding we're all different. We all come from different backgrounds. We come from different kinds of families and education. We all bring our own stuff to the table, and it's all for God's work. But we have to all respect that, even when it seems completely foreign and not able to be understood. So that's, that's unity. And what's holiness, then? This striving for right living, what, is, what does that look like? What does right living look like? Living, well, I was going to say living the way Jesus did, but not literally, but, but living like a Christian. Yeah, and Paul tells us in his other letters, he doesn't spell it out yet here, but... He, he talks about what that kind of living looks like. He talks about all the different things that you should be doing and the things that you should not be doing. He's very literal about it. He says, you know, these are the things you need to move out of your life. And they're basically the kinds of things that pagans who have come into the church now um, would have been common in their life. You know, thing, things like adultery, sexual uh, impurity and fornication and all those things. Um, thievery, stealing, getting the best of another person, even if it means manipulating or taking what they need. It was, it was a wild world in the pagan lands. Uh, he's saying all that stuff you've got to put away. That stuff's got to go. And then he talks about love and faith and trust and the fruits, the fruits of the Spirit, right? And he lays those out. He says this is the way you want to live. So he's, he's pretty clear. That's what holiness of life looks like. And then it's all undergirded with a foundation of forgiveness and reconciliation. That when we go the wrong way, we ask forgiveness. We reconcile. We forgive. We ask forgiveness and we give forgiveness. And that gets us back in the right track. So a holiness of life. Scripture is pretty clear about all that. Let's go to knowledge and discernment. How do we gain? What do, they, what, do they, what do you think he means by knowledge? Through studying the scriptures. Yeah, we said it's, you know, it's about knowing good from evil, and you're going to know that by knowing how God thinks, knowing how the Messiah thinks, how the Messiah acted, how the Messiah, what he's promised to us, all those things. Um, we need to be knowledgeable about those things. He's saying if you're not knowledgeable about those things, you're not going to always be able to tell good from evil. Oh, there are times that are going to be, it's going to be real clear, but it's going to be times in your life you're not going to be able to tell. You're going to say either both those options are evil or both those options are good. I don't know which one. And he's saying you're going to need knowledge to be able to tell the difference. And not only that knowledge, but you're going to need discernment. How do you understand that word discernment? We don't use it a lot in, 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 the, in the real world. It's, it's, it tends to be kind of a religious term. Sometimes you hear it. How do you understand discern, discernment? Well, is it taking the knowledge that you've gained and using it to make the right decisions? Moving yeah. forward, yeah. listening to God, knowing what's God's words, what's God's voice, 
Yep. And then applying them to your light. I think that's a great way to put it, Betty. Um, it's taking kind of the book knowledge, the knowledge, right? The information, uh, the data, what we know about the Messiah, what we know about God, what we know about Jesus. And now letting that permeate our life and the way we think and make decisions. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, right? We have a Holy Spirit residing in us to help us discern God's will in particular situations. That whatever it is that we're doing, we're going to filter that through the way, through God's word and the way he would want it. And the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. It's taking information and applying it with our experiences. It's taking experience. It's taking what we uh, have learned to trust about God, what the experience we've had with him in our life, putting all that together as I make a new decision about something today. What, can, what do I know about God? What has he shown me in my life? What does he tell me in scripture? And what is the Holy Spirit telling me and whispering in my ear? How do I put all that together? That's discernment. So those are the things that he's calling us to um, as a church. And that's what a church would look like. It's a church that then is struggling, working, striving to be able to advance on each of those four fronts. It's quite the challenge, isn't it, for a church? It's a challenge for us as individuals. Um, the good news is that the Messiah also promises his help to make all of that happen. We're not just out there in our own human strength trying to fight our way forward. Before we press on, any other thoughts or uh, comments or questions about all this? All right, let's go on and begin the uh, next section, which is verses 12 through 18. And I am going to bring that back up again. See if I can make this work. Okay. Can everybody see it? Okay. Somebody want to read uh, 12 through 14, please? I'll read it. Okay. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. They are much more bold to speak the word without fear. All right. Somebody want to finish that up, 15 down through 18? Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely that seem to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So... This section, Paul is now getting pretty personal, and he's telling us more about himself and this situation. So let's remember, the Philippians knew he was struggling in prison, and there were different problems, difficult problems for Paul, and he was struggling with these things. Uh, and even in the church in Ephesus, uh, they were having their own problems, the Philippians knew all this. And this letter seems to take on a, uh, 
uh, it's a way for him to ease their minds and help them to understand how to cope through the challenges that they're facing, but also knowing what's happening to him, someone they love and who is in partnership with them for the gospel. And he says that his situation, here he is in prison, is somehow allowing the gospel to spread and that it's been heard and accepted by even more people. So it's a whole, he's starting to, to present a whole new way to think about hardships. Um, he's looking at difficult situation that he's in and he's looking at it differently than he used to or that the way uh, others would. Now that the Messiah has come, the Messiah has also, in the way that the Messiah changes our thinking, he's changing the way Paul thinks about what it means to be going through some kind of uh, difficulty. What, what, and that somehow what looks like a tragedy has somehow become good news hidden within it. The tragedy of being thrown into prison where he was, we think, for the better part of two years, that instead of that just being a tragedy, it's somehow there's good news in the midst of all this. And then he goes, and then he, he, he kind of presents a puzzle to us there in verse 15 about people that are trying to somehow make more trouble for him even though he's in prison. Somehow there are some out of envy and rivalry that are making his life difficult, thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So there's something funny going on there, and we'll see what we can, what we can learn about that, but that's kind of a, an odd twist, isn't it? So th those first two verses, or three, 12, 13, and 14, he's basically saying that this idea of his being in prison... Um, I want you to know that what has happened to me being in prison has actually advanced the gospel and that the whole imperial guard has heard that he's chained up here and he's chained up because he's preaching about the Messiah. Now, every little town would have had imperial guard. The larger the town, the more imperial guard there would be. These are Roman guards. They were there to keep peace, period. Um, Pontius Pilate was part of the imperial guard. He led the imperial guard in, uh, in Jerusalem. He um, would have had many guards who were under him, and that whole group was called the imperial guard. Now, he's saying the imperial guard are all talking about the fact that I'm in prison for the Messiah. And so he's saying that's not necessarily such a bad thing. Remember, Paul... You know, he's, he's on his way sort of toward Rome. We know later he's on his way, he's going to get to Rome. He actually wants to get the gospel to the very heart of the Roman Empire. He wants to get the people of influence and help them to hear the gospel. And so now the Roman guard, who have their people that they report to, he's now getting the gospel message right into the very... Uh, into the people who are connected to the people who are connected to the people of power. Do we know the circumstances of his imprisonment? I mean, was he in a house that called a house of rest? Was he chained up? Or? Yeah, but no, he's not in a house. Um, yes, he would be chained up. Sometimes we know he told us he was in stocks. Other times he would simply be in a cell. Uh, it's called house arrest. That's the way they explain it or translate it in English. And what it, ju it just simply means, he has not yet been sentenced. He's awaiting trial. And sometimes you waited years for the trial. Once you're sentenced, you either pay your penalty or you go to prison. And prison is a different kind of place. This is a holding cell. Um, and a lot of people would be in holding cells for anything from not paying their taxes to, you know, you name it. Uh, you could end up there. And so he's in there probably among others, <clears throat> but they are confined. But friends can come in and visit. 
friends bring you food every day. They could sit and have a conversation with you. Um, they bring you clothes, take care of your basic needs, but you're confined. But it wouldn't be a house. It would be a cell, some sort of a, uh, a jail. The guards one at a time, but maybe a different one each day. Would have been different guards coming through. Could have been a number of guards, like you might see you know, in a small jail today, a number of guards at one time. A lot of guards coming and going at different times. And it seems that Paul takes the opportunity to share the gospel with anybody that came within hearing distance. He wanted them to know why he was there. He had this message for people like those guards that the one you think is actually the true Lord of the world, guess what? He's not the one. I'm here to tell you who the one really is. And so they're going off. And he's saying they're all talking about this. Um, and so it's good news. They're saying, people are saying, well, why is he in prison? What, what is this Paul? What, what is he did? Oh, he's talking about this Jewish king that, they were, that they've been prophesying about for a couple thousand years. And now he's saying this Messiah came and that that God is actually the real God and it's, it's not really Caesar. And so this kind of conversation, you can imagine, would be going on. They all know he represents this new Jewish Messiah, and they're reflecting on what probably sounds like a very strange message to them. He says then that other Christians are actually speaking uh, with more courage. Only every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in prison. Oh, but go back to 14, sorry. The most, and most of the brothers, those would be the other Christians, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Why would they be more bold to speak without fear when they see that he was locked up for it? Yeah, because it was for Christ. So here's a guy who is willing to go to prison for what he's saying. So, you know, you listen to people who are, who are saying this or saying that. It's another thing. Once you see them actually being imprisoned for what they stand for, all of a sudden their words take on more significance, don't they? Um, and in some ways it's like, well, golly, if he's willing to go to prison for this, surely I can at least speak with a little more, more boldness myself when you look at what he's willing to do for the gospel. I think it takes on that kind of, that kind of sense that, yeah, you, you believe this and you're, you're encouraged that he would do that. Yeah, I can at least speak up. The guards and others are now paying more attention <clears throat> and they're starting to see that there's a conflict starting here. There's a conflict that's beginning between who the government says is our king and lord, Caesar, and who this Jew who came here, this Greek Jew from Israel, who has come and is telling us that he knows the Messiah, who is the real ruler of the world and the universe. So this Messiah and the leader of the Roman Empire, there's going to be this conflict, and it's starting to take shape here. Then we get to this, this puzzle I mentioned, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll close. Some are proclaiming the king out of envy and others out of love. We don't know who they are, but there are people there, not necessarily in the prison, but others outside who are making even more trouble for Paul. There was definitely, and, and Acts, Acts reflects on this, and Acts tells us, um, it said, Paul was considered dangerous 
because he is preaching a different king. And so some would have looked to him, even people who may have been, you know, ready to hear or at least give a hearing to the faith that he was preaching, are now saying, no, 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 wait a minute. He's preaching a different king. That's, that's, that's tyranny. That's trying to overthrow <clears throat> Caesar. <clears throat> There's a battle here, and he's trying to overthrow the emperor. There can't be another emperor. There's only one. That is Caesar. And so what he's saying is going to, um, is going to disrupt society. It's going to turn over our way of life. And that's not good. So that was definitely something that was out there. And there may have been people who originally had been followers of him and then said, uh-uh, now he, what he's preaching, that's going to upset the whole apple cart here. And everybody's going to come after us and we're going to be in the middle of this. Uh-uh, we're out of here. We're not, no, don't, don't follow this guy. But Paul was saying that no matter who is talking about him and the Messiah, whether they're, they're in favor or not, or supportive or not, or they think he's crazy or not, he says it doesn't matter. He's still going to celebrate the fact that people are now talking about the Messiah who weren't even thinking about him before. He's going to celebrate in all of that. And so by speaking of Jesus as the king, even though they may not believe it, they're spreading the word. And that's not new in Scripture. Think about when Pilate crucified, had Jesus crucified, and what does the sign he put on the top of the cross? It said, King of the Jews. Now, he put that there sarcastically just to say, <laughs> see, here's the one who thinks he's King of the Jews, right? And somebody said he ought to change that sign to he said he's king of the Jews. He said, no, what I put there, I put there. Well, he was actually telling the truth, wasn't he? Even though that wasn't what he was trying to do. Caiaphas, the high priest, when he was in the midst of the trial with Jesus, he said, it's better than one person might die than the entire nation. That's true. It was better that one person die that the entire nation, the entire world would be forgiven of their sin and be saved. So what Caiaphas was saying was not, he, was, he didn't mean it that way at all, but what he said turned out to actually be true. And so it's a time like that <clears throat> when without trying to necessarily promote the gospel or the Messiah or, or, or speak in favor of Paul, they were actually announcing the Messiah anyway without even realizing it. And Paul was saying, I'm absolutely fine with that. I'm just fine with it. All right. I think we'll close down right there, and then we'll pick up the next time we're together. Any questions, thoughts? Is it is it making some sense? Is it cl being clarified for you guys? I mean, it's Paul is dense at times. Today it did. I'm sorry, Melissa? I said today it did. Good, okay. It's coming together. Okay, a little bit about going forward. Uh, next week is Ash Wednesday. Oh, I should let all of you know, we did decide on Monday night that we will open, uh, we will open up again uh, for services on Sundays, 8 and 10, 15, starting on the first Sunday of Lent, uh, which is February 21. So both services uh, will be masked and distanced and sanitizing and doing all the things we did when we opened last summer. Uh, but we'll be back open. We'll continue to live stream the 1015 service as we have been doing, but we'll be, uh, we'll be open again uh, for people to come in person. Thank goodness. So on uh, Ash Wednesday, which is next week, we have a service at noon and one at seven. So we won't have a Bible study next Wednesday. We'll pick up the following week uh, where we left off today. So that would be the 24th. Uh, during Lent, we are also going to have a, uh, 
a Tuesday night time of study and worship. It'll be very different from this. Uh, Father Chris is going to lead some of those. I'm going to lead some of them. Uh, and so that's something if you're if if you are looking for a, a Lenten discipline that you want to add, or you can share that with others. It'll be Tuesday nights, seven o'clock, live at church, and live streamed, but not recorded. So it'll be done live if you want to join in, um, or you can come in person, and we'll be in the parish hall and we'll be stretched out in there. Give us all plenty of room, and uh, we think we can do that safely. So that'll start the Tuesday uh, after Ash Wednesday. So it'll be the 23rd. Anything else? Okay. Everybody have a good day, good rest of your week. You too. All righty. Take care, everyone.